what is it? <laughs> Good question, I don't know actually. Um, so the first thing is to recognize that we have a whole range of different motivational systems that have evolved in the human brain. We have a capacity for caring, we have a capacity for competing, for having sex and so on. And the point about it is that these different motivational systems organize the brain and the mind in lots of different ways. So the way you pay attention, the way you think, the way your body and your brain works, the kind of feelings you have and the behaviors you want to enact will be very dependent upon your motivation. Now that's going to be important because we will see that different social groups, different societies, different politics tend to focus on activating different types of motivation within individuals. We know that the origins of caring behavior, which goes on to become compassion, is very old. We can trace it back into the early caring of infants. And here, basically, what develops, what evolves, is a capacity to be sensitive to suffering the need of an infant and then to be able to take remedial action. So yeah, a mammalian um, parent will know when to feed an infant, when to protect an infant, when to rescue an infant. And that's basically the basic algorithm, the basic process uh, for compassion as we can see. So you can start off, there's a crocodile there lift, taking their little hatchling to the uh, water, but it really gets under underway with mammals, okay? Mammals are important. And the other thing that's important with compassion is it's not one thing, you know? You, there are different aspects to compassion according to the context. What we know is that the evolution of attachment and uh, affiliative behavior actually came with a range of neurophysiological and physiological structures. Now, we, we don't need to get too much into this, but we do need to be aware that compassion is rooted in basic brain systems. That's very, very important because if we don't stimulate those brain systems, then compassion may not arise. I'm not going to go too much into this, but just to say you have what is called an autonomic nervous system and one branch of it stimulates you and gets you excited and gets you doing things or makes you angry or wants to run away. But the other aspect of your autonomic nervous system is your parasympathetic system and that's about soothing, calming and also it's very much linked into caring behavior. Sympathetic is more competitive parasympathetic, more caring. It's not quite as simple as that, but it's a useful sort of mode. Now, we also know that the, the vagus nerve, which is part of the autonomic nervous system, is very important for well-being, for pro-social behavior, for caring behavior. And this system is uh, not always highly stimulated in competitive societies. In fact, it tends to get subdued in competitive societies. Now, what's really important is that we know there's considerable evidence now that humans went through a period when they were hunter-gatherers of uh, caring and sharing. It's called caring and sharing, really, where instead of competing, which is what a lot of primates do, you get a top dog and dominant male and all that, uh, Caring and sharing was really the name of the game. And we now know that uh, when our relationships are based on caring and sharing, this has profound effects on the brain, even on genetic expression, even on uh, epigenetics. So very, very briefly then, bonobos are a little bit like us, but certainly early hunter-gatherers were based on caring and sharing. And actually, individuals in groups that try to accumulate, try to gain status by having more than others, they were kicked out and sometimes actually even killed. So this is quite important within our evolutionary history. We're very much carers and sharers, but we were in small groups and we didn't store resources, which is also quite important as you'll see in a moment. So there's quite a lot of evidence now that humans went through a period in their evolution where they became very focused on caring and sharing, very cooperative, and accumulation of wealth and resources was very much looked down upon. That was absolutely a no-no. So that's basic hunter-gatherers, communal child care, re relatively loose sexuality, there was no control over sexuality, few possessions, status came from altruism and being caring, and as I say, the main strategy was caring and sharing. Now this is important because this also gave rise to intelligence, and it's our intelligence that turns caring into compassion. So it's what we call knowing intentionality. When we can use a caring motivation knowingly, then that becomes compassion. So caring behavior in animals is caring behavior, but compassion is when we bring this awareness to uh, how to address issues of suffering. So here's our basic psychology. Okay, so I'm about two thirds of the way through now, just to let you know. This is our basic psychology for compassion, that we are sensitive to the suffering and needs of others. Okay, and then we make a commitment to try to prevent suffering and to alleviate it. And that means that at the core of compassion, which is not obviously 
always recognized is courage, the courage to engage with suffering, because sometimes uh, the suffering that people are experiencing is, is pretty awful. So for example, people on COVID wards, doctors on COVID wards will risk their lives to save others. But the second aspect of compassion, which is sometimes forgotten, is the wisdom and dedication. There's no good me going onto a COVID ward because I wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> I'd end up causing more harm than good, wouldn't I really? So we need the wisdom. And that's really a, a big issue in compassion in politics. It's the courage to address the issue of suffering, inequality and so forth, but also dedication to the wisdom to know what to do because this is not easy. Compassion solutions are not easy solutions. They can be really quite uh, difficult solutions, but if you're motivated by compassion, then the way your mind will solve that problem will be very different than if you're motivated for competitiveness. And this can become a daily affirmation to live to be helpful, not harmful. And we've been working with schools and businesses so that a business seeks to contribute to humanity, not to damage it to be supportive of the workforce, not to exploit them. So these are very basic uh, mottos that you can derive from a compassion motivation. And again, working with compassion and politics, that politics has a desire to contribute to humanity, not to harm it. And that's quite important because, as you know, some of the compassion politics is seeking to develop policies that do not knowingly harm others. Okay, so once, just to mention to you quickly, the emotions that somebody like this might be feeling are very different from somebody like this or somebody like uh, somebody who is uh, involved in um, uh, caring um, for uh, somebody who was bereaved. Okay, so I get back to that. So the, don't get out of your mind that compassion is one thing. It is not one thing. There are many, many different aspects to compassion. What joins all of the aspects, what would join somebody like him and somebody like him and somebody caring for somebody, a bereaved person, is the motive, the desire to address suffering, not to be a cause of it, and to use wisdom to address it. And finally, I need to say that what happened with agriculture, my last slide, what happened with agriculture is we got a complete change in our social ecology. Instead of caring and sharing, what happened was we began to store resources. When we get, began to store resources, then we began to have a hierarchy of wealth owners. And from there, unfortunately, it's all been downhill. And then came the rise of the aggressive male. And from there, the empires grew. And so basically, for the last five to 6,000 years, we've been living in a totally alien ecology for our brains, because our brains not really designed to work with high resource environments. And the last few thousand years have shown what a mess we've made of it with our torches and our holocausts and our Roman games and empires and you know and all the major empires have all been run by pretty aggressive males who then use terror tactics basically to suppress the rest of the population. If you look at the history of England, for example, the number of people that were hung just for having, you know, stealing and so forth and so on. So the problem of politics, last point, the problem for politics today is that we're having to work with a brain that is not really designed to work with high levels of resources because what happens when when you do that is that you then produce what is called control and hold psychology where people become very interested in gaining maintaining their own control over wealth that was absolutely a no-no in hunter gatherers you could not do that but in western societies you certainly can and there's now a lot of data to show that as people become wealthier they become less empathic they give less of their uh, finances and resources to charities and good causes. They have an increased sense of entitlement. They deserve it. So you can have people with multi-million pound bonuses who say, I deserve it. How, you deserve it more than a nurse risking their lives in the COVID world. How does that work? Well, to that person, because they're in that psychology, it seems perfectly acceptable. The concept of deserve is really, really important. Then you also have the issue of resentment for those who have more and so forth. And what we now have, and uh, Obama actually was talking about this the other day, is that we have two types of fear in these competitive psychologies because of the way it operates in the brain. The first is for those who have more, they have a fear of losing and losing their access to having more. So they have a fear of losing what they've got. And for those who haven't got, they have a fear of not having not having the slice of the pie. So what we've got in, 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 modern psychi in the modern world since the advent of agriculture, these two profound fears 
with those who are wanting to climb the ladder and get higher and higher and those who feel that they can't get high at all can't get on at all and that really is what politics are having to manage having to manage the fear that is generated with a brain that's not really used to dealing with high levels of resources and competitive behavior. We're not really that good with competitive behavior. It actually brings out the worst of us. And as I say, you've only got to look at the history of the last few thousand years to realize what a vicious, nasty species we can be. So that's the problem for politics then. How do we take a hunter-gatherer brain, which is designed for caring and sharing, can be fantastically um, compassionate and physiologically and health-wise and every-wise, works very well and put it into a society where the ecology is uh, very wealthy. I mean, we are, uh, uh, you know, we have much more wealth in the world now than we did even just a few thousand years ago. So it's a tricky one, uh, but what I would try to impress is that it is about how we manage our brains. Because it, you know, if we don't, then what's happening is you're just getting all these different kinds of fears clashing with each other. So there we are. Compassion is the most courageous, the most moral of all of the motives. There is no, a motive that's more courageous and moral than that, because we're gonna take on suffering, we're gonna take on these problems. And uh, that's how we should see it. So compassion is not about being nice and being kind and all of that stuff, it's sensitivity to suffering. Thank, thank you, Paul. Um, thank you very much, that was a great opening. Um, could, you, could you take down your screen share? Thank you, that, that was a great opening, thank you very much. Um, we'll now move on. To, oh um to i'm sorry uh when we were starting we were just about to vote so i had to keep the bit of my phone open for voting uh so i couldn't access the the bio details but the, our next speaker is saskia periad abdo who is um in the psychological government program with the british psychological society and she is going to talk about the psychological government program saskia Amazing. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, first of all, hello and apologies for the shadow in the back. I'm in Edinburgh at the moment and the sun goes down quite early on. Um, so first of all, thank you very much to Jennifer for inviting me to join in this panel. Um, we've known each other for a while now. Um, and what I'm hoping to speak to you all for the next few minutes is about how we at the British Psychological Society have translated the work of a lot of our members. Um, we're basically standing on the shoulders of giants, people like Paul, and translating the psychological evidence into frameworks and actions that we can then hopefully try to let to a point where we are changing the way policy is made, rather than just standing from the back and saying, well, the policy is made in a way that causes harm. Um, so without further ado, um, I do not have slides, so you are going to be stuck listening to my voice for a little while. Um, but we all know that terms such as placemaking and people-centered policies and well-being are back on the policy agenda. And that's for a very good reason. And it's because there are clear deficiencies and gaps that are seen in the way traditional policymaking takes place. Um, but while the need for bringing people and their psychology into the policymaking process is well understood, we believe that there is a bit of a lack of clarity on how this can actually be done practically. And psychology and the work of many of our psychologists does offer a way to move past these barriers. Um, and as the Psychological Government Program, what we've done is that we have established a series of projects to kind of look at different gaps we see in policymaking. And I'm gonna take you through one of the ones we've published now, which is actually on our website and looks at cognitive strain in parliament. And you will be very glad to hear that a lot of the themes we looked at practically are ones that Paul actually looked at and has done for us all at the moment. So the way the cognitive strain report came together is we had a series of off the record interviews with both parliamentarians and staffers across the summer, looking at from an occupational perspective, what was the psycholo psychology of their work? And through our research, we found that there were nine key stressors that people navigated as they underwent um, their day-to-day -day lives working in Parliament. And that was navigating competing expectations, the pressures of social media, navigating distrust, this whole concept of political labor, which is different from emotional labor, but it very quickly can be encapsulated with what do you do when you have to vote in a way that balances your constituency needs versus your party needs, what's the psychological ramifications of that. Um, Organizational culture, which was very much on the managerial side, your duty of care towards your employees at the end of the day, working as an MP in Parliament basically means that you are running a small business 
within parliament, all with completely different forms and completely different functions. Um, and last but not least, leadership, lifestyle, control, and the temporal nature of parliament. So how does it feel being an MP, having to run your work, your office, when a snap election can take place at any moment? And as the last past few years have shown, we've had about ooh, three elections in five years. So it's quite a lot of work and quite a lot of things to balance. Um, and I'm conscious on time because I only have one more minute left. But the one thing that I do want to stress before passing it on to Jamie to make sure we still run on time is the fact that this need for cross collaboration and this need for giving as much as people are, just, are taking is recognized in the people we're listening to and the people who contribute in the study. And I do think that that's something to be hopeful about. It's the fact that even though a lot keeps us apart, whether it's outside parliament or inside parliament, there is that recognition both outside looking in and on the inside looking out that we do need to bridge these gaps and find better ways of working together. And we're hopeful that work that we do at the British Psychological Society can be a part of that moving forward. Ruth, I hope that's enough. I'm conscious on time. Well, I, I really appreciate that. And that was very, um, uh, sort of very disciplined of you indeed. Thank you. Um, there, there was a request in the chat for uh, if you could post a link to the report and that might be a way of people finding out more and then hopefully you might be able to say more in the Q&A. Uh, next, we've got Jamie Bristow um, from the Mindfulness Initiative, which I'm told is the first Policy Institute on Mindfulness. Jamie also acts as secretary to the APPG on Mindfulness. So great to have you here, Jamie. Yes, thank you so much, Ruth. Um, and thank you for stepping in. Um, great that you did from my perspective, because you have been really at the forefront of thinking about mindfulness and politics for the last seven or eight years. So, so hopefully you can join in the, the Q&A there. Um, so yes, I, what I'd like to contribute today um, is summarizing what I think is the most fundamental psychological principle underpinning our work and, and relaying some uh, personal insights from politicians, including yourself, about how mindfulness might uh, um, specifically support a healthy political discourse. But first off, uh, I think I need to make a clarification because although the word mindfulness is often associated with an, active, an activity or a health intervention, it is perhaps best understood not as a thing to do um, for a few minutes in the morning, but, um, but as an integral part of our psychology. That's because the ability to be mindful is a natural capacity and part of our precious human inheritance, if you will. Uh, it is a capacity that enables people to attend intentionally to the present moment um, with an attitude of openness, curiosity, and care. And like compassion, this capacity can vary, vary naturally from person to person and can be inten uh, intentionally developed through practice. Now, when I did, I did my um, psychology undergrad uh, all those years ago, I was, I was taught that there were certain aspects of personality um, that would not alter after about the age of seven. Um, but, but since then, psychologists and, and neuroscientists have found that, in fact, our brains can change um, and, and we change throughout our lives, uh, including the dimensions of personality that we used to think were uh, immutable. And this is, this is particularly true if we actually want to change ourselves. We can, we can cultivate through practice the bits of us we like and uh, the bits of us we want, we want more of in the, in the way that Paul has held up a vision for us. Um, uh, and on, on one level, this is no great revelation. I mean, we've known, we've known this for a long time. And to paraphrase Aristotle, we are what we repeatedly do. And, and so mindfulness training is just one form of practice, selecting a, a bit of our latent psychological potential and investing in it. If you wanted to, um, instead of being more mindful, be, be angrier instead, you know, have a, have a more angrier time, angrier society, you could consciously practice that and you could even build a structured ang anger based training program, but it would make you miserable. Um, but if, if you want to be sort of compassionate or more attentive or more self aware, you can actively methodically practice it. So the most fundamental question um, I'd like to raise is, is what are we practicing? Because we are always practicing something. If we're not consciously choosing what to practice, if we're not deliberately developing ourselves throughout our lives, then we're often entrenching through habit or enculturation some aspect of ourselves that is, that is misaligned with what we value or um, with what we want to be, or at least you know, some of the time. And of course, this aspect of our psychology, 
the changeable and cultivable nature of our interior worlds uh, has implications for everything we do. As Bill O'Brien, who's a, a hugely respected multinational CEO, once said, the success of an intervention depends upon the interior qualities of the intervener. So I'd suggest that the success of politics as a project of collectively making sense and making good decisions depends upon the interior qualities of the politicians. But we can't put it all on our poor MPs or members of the House of Lords. Particularly in a world of Twitter and hyperconnectivity, we are all responsible for the health of the body politic and for the interior conditions that our leaders, feel, our leaders feel able and encouraged to demonstrate. Far from feeling encouraged, there is a fear within Parliament that the media will frame any investment in the interior resources of our politicians as a needless indulgence. And there's a belief um, that, that the public will, will re most respond to pithy and polarizing attack lines, especially on um, social media. And so I'd go further and say that the success of a society's politics depends upon the interior qualities of its citizens at large. And as Joseph de Maistre said 200 years ago, in a democracy, a nation gets the government it, de it deserves, <laughs> perhaps. So basically I'm saying that we, you know, we don't have to leave it up to chance. Mindfulness training has alone been assessed by over 6,000 peer-reviewed academic articles. And it turns out that those who have um, developed this ability those who have developed this ability uh, tend to be more resilient to psychological distress, demonstrate stronger attention regulation and cognitive skills, better decision making, manage their emotions and behavior better, develop more satisfying relationships. And the emerging science also associates mindfulness with outcomes more directly relevant to politics, such as reductions in workplace hostility, uh, retaliation and discrimination, and increases in personal forgiveness, support for compromise and conflict resolution. Now, uh, believe it or not, you know, we have we have something of a world leading case study here in the British Parliament um, where a small group of MPs, you know, some of those who have been on the on the mindfulness course, uh, sort of 300 MPs and peers have been on the course, but there's a small group who attend a weekly drop in practice group. And, and amongst those um, parliamentarians, um, they've started to see glimpses of the impact on a cross party basis that mindfulness could have on political culture. So, for instance, Tim Lawton MP, uh, who's the Conservative co-chair uh, of the Mindfulness All-Party Group and a former minister, has observed that there is an affinity amongst those who have been on this mindfulness course and a rather more considered approach to exchanges of differing views. In other words, he said, we disagree better. Um, and as, as Ruth, Ruth has said uh, in the past, uh, asking, what, what is it that we, we learn from mindfulness that we can bring into our political practice? Uh, she said um, in a meeting recently, things like attentiveness, curiosity, compassion, generosity, groundedness, and what mindfulness, leading mindfulness teachers call responding, not reacting to people um, like other politicians. Lord Alan Howarth, uh, another vice chair of the All Party Group, has noted um, that the attitude of mutual respect, the willingness to listen, the kindness, the open-minded seeking after better understanding that mindfulness helps to inculcate are crucial cultural underpinnings for a better politics. Now, uh, interesting, um, uh, two, two common themes from all the comments made by parliamentarians are that practice helps them with perspective taking and also mutual respect. Uh, and there's probably uh, no better case study for mindfulness, and I'll finish on this one, than, uh, than former MP Chris Ruan, uh, who was in parliament for over 20 years before uh, losing his seat at the last election. Uh, his, his colleagues in his own party attest that he was at one point the worst heckler in the House of Commons uh, and he was described in the Daily Mail as a knuckle-dragging torturer's assistant who gre greeted every comment from the government benches with a derogatory witticism and to every contribution from the Labour benches he gave a grunt of approval. Now, when, when, uh, when mindfulness was, was discussed during PMQs last year, following a question from Chris, um, the, the then speaker, John Burko, took the opportunity to comment on his dramatic reformation um, since those early days, saying, uh, the honourable member seems to be a beneficiary of mindfulness himself, as he seems much more calm and phlegmatic fellow these days, which wasn't always the case in the past. We're very grateful to the honourable gentleman. Um, so Chris reported that some colleagues had criticised him for this, saying, you know, you'll lose your passion. But he said, I don't think you lose your passion. You, you, you derive your passion in a different direction. You also gain compassion. All the passions are increased. 
so in sum, um, if we aspire to a healthier, more productive political discourse, or if we want to act effectively and collectively in any, in any walk of life, then we should, we should all give a care to what aspects of our own psychology we are practicing, for they have political consequences for all of us. Are we cultivating the better angels of our nature, or are we entrenching our baser impulses? In an era, in an era where the algorithms of social media seem to amplify our darker sides, more than ever, we need assistance, tipping the odds in favor of those angels. Uh, and that's where psychology can play a role in politics and elsewhere by offering evidence-based development programs to help us to become more equal to the great challenges of our times. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. That's great. And uh, I think it's a really important point that bringing compassion and mindfulness into politics does not mean that we lose our passion and what we care about. And, and actually, it means we can channel it, I think, more effectively. Um, anyway, uh, moving swiftly on to Jennifer Nadel, who is the co-director of Compassion in Politics uh, and also uh, and Compassion in Politics and acts as the Secretariat for the APPG in Compassion in Politics. And they really are at the forefront of bringing ideas about compassion and inclusiveness into political life. Jennifer. Thanks so much. I just have to say how excited I am to be sharing a panel with all of you speakers because all of you have played such an important role in the development of compassion in politics as a movement. I'm grateful to all of you. So I'm really excited because psychology for me holds the key to so many of the things that are wrong on our political landscape at the moment, the division, the hate, and psychology is really something that has been so missing. My own background is that I was a lobby reporter for the BBC and then ITV's Home Affairs editor. I thought that was a toxic environment. I then came into politics that on the national executive of of one of the parties and was just overwhelmed by the level of toxicity I found that somehow when people are gathered together to try and do good, so much harm is done. And I got very bruised by that. So I took a step back to really try and get a handle on what was happening, why that was. And, um, and I came to the conclusion that what we see on the political landscape is often just a mirror of what we have going on inside of us. You know, when we're in conflict, those voices, those competing drives that Paul pointed out, they're all jostling inside of us. And when we are the victim of that, we simply acted out on a national scale. And, and you know, the work of, of Jamie is so important in actually the practice of what can we do about that. And I think that the kind of basic psychological education is so missing you know things like learning to recognize when we're triggered learning how to clear ourselves of old historic resentment so that we don't bring every past wrong into every current argument learning to recognize the role of our ego you know when we're coming from a place of fear when we're overly defended when we become overly attached to winning the argument because of our need to be right rather than being able to detach from it and look at the issue as a whole Similarly, especially in this divided age, how can we make others feel heard? How can we park our own internal objections to what someone's saying to enable them to have a safe space to say things that we may not agree with, that we may find very, very difficult to listen to? Again, psychological you know, tools, this is all known in psychology and we have to somehow bring that learning into politics if we want to make others feel safe and heard you know we all know what a role not being heard has played in our current political discourse and you know there's some interesting research Paul you can correct me if I've got this wrong which shows that in one American study when people were asked about their views on immigrants if they were offered a hand sanitizer before they answered the question they gave more generous and more open-hearted responses so the need to make us all feel psychologically safe so that we can hold ourselves while we listen to those we disagree with is incredibly important. So Matt Hawkins and I set up Compassion in Politics to really look at how we could bring some of that into politics and also how we could do two things. The first is to make the environment, the political environment more conducive to compassion, you know, 
Paul again and, and Saskia as well have talked about, you know, what happens when we're operating in a threat based environment. So how can we make the environment in within which we do politics more conducive to considered centered responses. And there are some obvious things that need changing in our view, which we are working on with the help of, uh, of many members of both houses and we welcome any other support for this. One is the way debates are conducted. We, um, we've got over 100 MPs signed up to our campaign to stop the nastiness, which is really just to introduce the same workplace requirements on the floor of the House of Commons as would be in any other working environment. So we took the ACAS definition of bullying and harassment and said, why shouldn't we just make sure that we don't have bullying and harassment on the floor of the House of Commons? And um, we got many members, thankfully, signing up to support that. But as yet, we haven't got buy in from the authorities for that very simple and obvious thing. Let's just not have a working environment where people can jeer and boo and shout at each other. How on earth are people going to be able to give undefended, considered, open minded, open hearted, curious responses in an environment which is adversarial and which is built around war, basically war between the two rows of benches, which are two swords widths apart. So looking at, at just tweaks in the way that, that we do it. And a, another aspect that we're looking at is the whipping system. Obviously, a whipping system is needed to try and drive uh, an agenda through. But at the moment, politicians are frightened out or bullied or intimidated or enticed out of, of saying what they really think and feel by those who oblige them to maintain party loyalty. And that just can't be right. We have to allow more space for individual MPs to vote with their conscience, to vote with what they actually believe rather than what they're being told to say, because that detachment from authenticity, from your authentic belief system leads to all sorts of distortions. And so part of the thinking in that respect of setting up the or providing the secretariat for the APPG of, and thanks to Ruth for her service on that, um, committee is that um, we provide a place where people can come together of whatever party and we're really glad that we have people from every party signed up to the APPG and really try and pr prioritize compassionate issues ahead of party loyalty you know and we had we had a new political party start up that quickly disappeared and our argument is that we don't need another political party we just need alliances that are based on values like compassion so what would that look like in terms of policy and again jamie has um, and saskia have both touched on this if we if we are operating from a more compassionate whole mindful place what sort of policies might arise well at the very least we think that that no legislation should be passed which would inflict harm on those in the most vulnerable circumstances you know, it's absolutely ludicrous that government, which is there to protect those who are struggling most, is able to enact policies without any audit or any assessment being done of what impact they will have on the poorest. So we can end up with our government to, to pushing people into um, hunger poverty. And we have, of course, seen, you know, the normalisation of hunger in this country which is just staggering given that we are still one of the richest economies in the world that hunger should become so commonplace. Um, we're also looking at, um, at section one of the Equality Act. I can see that I've got to wind up now so I just wanted to finish just with one thought which was how often in politics our attachment to a particular policy can cause division and we lose sight of what it is we're actually trying to do. So if you look at Brexit, it didn't matter on either side of the argument what arguments you put because there was such identification with either one or the other side which went way beyond anything intellectual and was to do with emotional need identification. So mindfulness, coming back to centre, using psychological techniques to ensure that you're operating from a centred place 
might enable us to get to the place that um, the Sufi poet Rumi, talk, Rumi talks about, which is out beyond ideas of good and evil. There is a place and I will meet you there. You know, how wonderful will it be if we could talk about solving our nation's problems in that place where we're no longer labeling anyone, we're just trying, trying to find the goodness that can be done. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you all to the, all members of the panel. I think it's been, you really complemented each other very well and brought, say complementary, but different perspectives. Um, now, it's slightly confusing because there's now some questions arriving in the chat and there are questions in Q&A. Um, some of those questions are aimed at particular panellists, but I think it, uh, what I'd like to suggest is that I read out say three questions and that that will all the panelists can can respond to so it doesn't end up with just one person answering questions um, there's one question although it's talk directed at BPS I, I think it's a more general question are there particular changes in the way politics work the BPS would recommend but I'd say the way panelists would recommend uh, what are your thoughts on the role of the media in promoting and maintaining an overly, overly competitive environment in politics? It seems that even when MPs want to work together, they're pitched against each other's in media discourse. Um, and how do we get a balance between structural change in politics and individual work on their own approaches? So perhaps we would see how we get on with those. We've only got about 15 minutes now. So um, Paul, would you like to go first? Uh, unmute the, the the phrase of the year. <laughs> Thank you. Unmute the phrase. Yeah. So very briefly, I suppose my bit is just to add a little bit to what's been said. What's been said is really so fundamentally important. Just to say, look, all of us, all humanity, are struggling with the fact we've got a brain that's out of context. That's why we have become the species that we have become, and we have become pretty vicious. You know, you think of slavery and all the rest of it. That we, all the things we've done. We're trying to work out how we can create systems that bring out the best in us, not the worst in us. And we know that competitive behavior can be helpful, but it often brings out the, the, the worst in us. So all the things that you, you're saying, Ruth, about the media and so forth, we need to understand what are the driving forces. Otherwise, we end up with good and bad people. There are no good and bad people. There are just people who have been created the same as I've been created. We've been built by our genes and we've been in our social conditions. We're just acting out whatever's going on. So we need to understand that, that otherwise we're going to get caught up in this competitive. What are the social contexts? That allows us to feel safe with each other to disagree with each other but not be disagreeable and that's not an easy that's not an easy question that, that needs a lot of thinking and some of what jennifer has been saying really hits the mark on that let us create an environment that we know will bring out the best in us not that will bring out the worst because we know that the intense competitiveness we've got at the moment brings out the worst in all of us actually <laughs> that's a very good point Saskia, would you like to um yeah, say something of course, I can see got name checked here, which is always appreciated. Um, to be to be frank, this is quite an answer is like, how long is a piece of string here? Um, but I'll keep it short. And I would say that there are two main things that the BPS would like to see. And number one is look at psychology and being more incorporated in the evidence space from the beginning, which means when you look at a new policy, are you starting from a place where you're embracing the emotion? Are you bringing people into policy making? Are you actually co-producing? And by co-producing, I don't mean having a government consultation after a decision has already been made. I mean co-producing with psychological evidence, with psychological support in a way that actually brings people into policymaking. And the second component, and that's more of a big macro level idea, and that's psychology as a conduit. So not just as the evidence base, psychology as a framework to how you approach a problem. And that's where questions which we are looking at is how do you harness collective decision making and surrogate decision making and accountability within the context of Whitehall and government? How can you use psychological frameworks and tools to help people working in these political environments do a better job and navigate what can be very, very difficult decisions at a very, very difficult time? So the one thing I'll say, which kind of encapsulate what we're trying to do at the BPS is if you were an athlete and you were playing on a football field, it's not a weakness to have a performance coach or a coach on the sideline to help you navigate your decisions. If you are a high profile commander in an army, you are 
purposely and continuously vetted to make sure you have the psychological skills to make very difficult decisions that can impact entire troops. Why don't we have that access, that support and that understanding in Parliament and with senior civil servants? At the end of the day, it's a job and sometimes you need added support to be able to do your job well. Thank you. Uh, Jamie? Yeah, thank you. I'd like to pick up on the question about individual versus stru structural tr change. Um, and, and just note that, no, we can't put all the emphasis on, on individuals as much as coaching and, and sort of development programs are, are part of the picture. Um, but there are examples from other walks of life where, um, where what is called the kind of the cognitive infrastructure of the whole organization is considered, a little bit like Saskia is talking about there. And, and there's a particular thing called organizational mindfulness, which is separate from individually trained mindfulness. And this is particularly um, relevant in the, th in the organizational theory, again, around in the military, um, uh, like aircraft carriers, but also uh, nuclear, um, what do you call them, power, power plants, uh, and air traffic control centers places where it's really bad if anything goes wrong, um, where you absolutely have to be alert to novelty, highly responsive, uh, great communicators. Um, and, 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 in, and in those environments, they put in the processes and the group culture in place to make sure the whole organization, the organism, uh, as a, a sensing, decision-making, acting body could be described as mindful. Um, and, and so I, you know, I, th I think there are ways in which um, well, this is being looked at by people who are, who are interested in systems theory, organizational dynamics, and, and what, what qualities like awareness, like, like com compassion, can be inculcated at, at, at that kind of level. So I would love to get the conversation in Parliament to that, to that point, and speaking to the House, you know, the Speaker of the House of Commons and the House of Lords about, you know, what kind of chamber do you want and what kind of processes and forms can you put in place to make that more likely? At the moment, we're still you know, we're still very much talking about individual mindfulness. Thank you. Uh, and Jennifer? Well, in terms of the media, it, it really takes its lead from politics. We have an adversarial system. So when someone thinks they, they've actually made a bad decision and they want to improve it, they're talked about as having made a U-turn. When someone agrees with someone else, it's talked of as a concession. So we do need to, to change the way the media talk about it, but I think that has to come down to our political leaders learning to praise those behaviours which actually good leaders have, such as the ability to reconsider, to bring others on board. And in terms of trying to make this, the, the environment more conducive to that, we are, the, the MPs on the APPG and a large number of civil, civil society groups are looking to really change the way that online hate is dealt with. Again, it's something that has been completely normalised and the fact that social media companies fail to take responsibility for publishing and republishing and republishing hate, which leads to mental ill health, physical ill health. So um, do check out our website and we would love all of you to be involved in that because of course what what happens in one place then gets amplified elsewhere. So the whole environment needs to be looked at. Thank you. Um, now there were a number of, oh, a number of questions which were summed up rather well by one which has just disappeared from the Q&A. But in effect, I think, and it was but from Tim, somebody or other, but I'm sorry, you've just disappeared. Um, but really the, the question uh, was the compatibility of party politics with a more mindful, compassionate forms of politics and how do we bring that into the party political system. So I'm sorry I've not uh, put it exactly as, as it's been put, but as I say there are a number of, of, of questions that relate mm -hmm. to, to that challenge. So let's start with Saskia this time. So I would argue that yes, um, I think especially we, I think there's a lot of great examples of practice currently. The question it's not scaled up. So a lot of big policy agendas like the, like the Northern Powerhouse was at the end of the day a conservative 
agenda, Conservative Manifesto Pledge, that was only made possible because it had support from the devolved regions and by a lot of Labour MPs who subsequently became Labour Metro mayors. Um, and I would also say things like Social Value Act. That is a Conservative, well, it was a 2012 Act, so it's a Conservative legislative piece of work, which a lot of Labour MPs and SNP MPs are currently pushing forward. So I would argue that it absolutely is possible. The question is that we don't have clear structures that allow for that collaborative working to take place. So what we currently have are a lot of MPs who may be very collegiate with one another, who might collaborate with one another on one-off issues or on campaigns who after working together for years realize, well, actually we've worked together on 20 campaigns. Maybe it's time to just go for dinner and actually have a conversation you know, you have this idea, I have this idea, let's make it work. So I would argue that we have this. We just don't have it formalized, operationalized in a way we can scale it up. And the last thing I will add, which is a complicating factor, which is parliament specific, in my opinion, is that if you even were to go to, through the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, you have an election every five years. You have churn, you have uncertainty, you have new people you have to keep working with. And you may build up to that norm or you may build up to that approach, but if it's not operationalized and if it's not established as a clear norm for anybody who enters into parliament for the first time, then you always go back to the bottom of the staircase at the end of the day. So hopefully that answers your question, Tim, but it's a great question. Uh, Jennifer, as I say, it's a, it's a question that quite a few people have asked in different ways. Um, yeah, Jennifer. Okay, I'm not sure whether this will answer it, but, but two things. Firstly, that training is really important. It's really, really important. We, we are not given psychological education at school and then we come into a bear pit and we're expected to somehow know how to encounter all of that so you know we offer training to organizations parties local parties are coming to us for training to try and learn a different way of dialoguing and having these conversations but i would also say that you know this mother of all parliaments has two much more functional children in the welsh and scottish parliaments you know they have done some of the work we're not we're not trying to invent something new you know i spoke to the 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 equivalent of the speaker in in at hollywood and they were just like no one would make animal sounds they'd just be asked to leave the room so it you know it's not actually that complicated we make it complicated but it doesn't have to be uh, Paul? Yes, I think, again, just basically looking at the science, what is the science of how we can work together when we have differences? I mean, things like having circular, not people facing each other. I mean, there are so many scientific um, ideas about how you help people to cooperate. There's a lot of work on international politics, international negotiations about getting sides to work together. So th these are really important things. I think what I would say, however, is that many politicians come into politics because they want to make a difference and how do we harness that deep motivation that I want to make a difference I want to make a difference how do we harness that motivation so that we can all come together to make a difference now you know like in my profession in psychology we all want to do good things for mental well-being but we disagree on what those are but we all have the same desire to try to improve our therapies but we disagree about what the best way to do that so if we can just agree that actually what we're here to do is to improve humanity as best we can and not do things that harm it, that would be wonderful. And then we can disagree on the means, but at least we're agreed on the focus. We're all coming together. That's our, that's our joint cooperative venture. We're all here to do that because humans have got a terrible set of problems to face with climate change and or inequalities and so, so on and so on. But if we can just agree on that one motivation, we're all here to try to improve humanity and not to harm it. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, thanks, Paul. And um, Jamie? Well, very briefly, Ruth, I might just repeat some of the uh, comments that you and your, your colleagues made recently about the potential in the committee system uh, in Parliament, that actually, um, I, well, we've been working internationally um, since uh, about 2015, helping to establish mindfulness training in, in other parliaments around the world and have successfully done that in about 10, 10 countries. And what's really struck me is how special the all-party parliamentary group ecosystem is. So we have the psychology, mindfulness and compassion, all-party groups here, all representing this sort of cross-party dialogue where, where um, uh, and Tim Lawton was saying the other day that particularly 
uh, in areas like mindfulness where you're, where you're coming together, not because of a particular policy you want to advocate, but because of, of a general approach, it can, it can really sort of cultivate a, a way of working together that isn't really present in the rest of the system. And, and, and where you have committees that are much more formal than all party groups um, and have a, have a real role, like a formal role, like often the relationships that are there, you don't, they don't get televised, they don't get, you don't have snippets from them on Twitter and you don't get them thousands of likes. But what you do get is a really sort of collegiate uh, collective intelligence. Um, and, and there's a potential for the British Parliament quite easily actually to give, to give those committees a little bit more power. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid we're not going to have time for more questions. I just want to um, quote, it's, it's more of a suggestion, uh, which I'd like um, people to think about, uh, the parliamentarians who are here, um, but Jennifer and Jamie, perhaps in particular, it's from Jonathan Wines. He says, practically, how about creating a charter of mindful interaction to directly encourage respect, compassion, kindness, etc." plus starting all meetings with two to three minutes of mindful meditation, question mark, direct action, question mark. Uh, and yes, it would, we, it, we would have been good if we had started, I'm afraid I was feeling extremely unmindful when I started this meeting because of having to vote. But um, I'm really sorry that we haven't got longer because there are so many interesting questions and comments that have come out both in the chat and the Q&A and I'm just wondering in terms of, I mean, we could really have done with another half hour at least, and we probably still would have been going because there's so much that our panelists have to contribute. But I'm just wondering as follow up to the meeting, whether it would be possible to um, email all those who've signed up for it with a link to how to the recording. Um, if Paul is willing to share his slides, a link to them. Thank you, Paul, because I think um, a lot of people would, would, would very much like to see those. Um, and any thoughts that people have? And, and I don't know, I mean, it may be that it just isn't the, the person power to do this, but um, if there was some way of just putting in a note, or I don't know if, if there's going to be a note of the meeting, that would be great. Um, but also um, building into that some of the comments that have come up on the chat that um, it's I find it personally I find it very difficult to keep up with comments on the chat especially if I'm trying to chair the meeting um, but there's a lot of valuable thoughts there which it be a shame to lose really so the organizers might just like to think about how we can best capture what has come out of what I think has been a very rich fruitful meeting um, with lots of ideas about how we change politics, create a more mindful politics in the context that, that Paul set us in terms of thinking about what uh, the meaning of compassion and how we can appeal to the compassionate side of our natures and the kind of structural um, constraints on that at present that we live in a very competitive society um, and how do we steer our way through that. So I found it very valuable. I hope uh, everyone else who's been here, we've had over a hundred participants. So um, I think it's been extremely, yeah, extremely good um, meeting. I'd just like to thank all our panelists, Paul, Jennifer, Jamie, Saskia, uh, for your contribution and thank all of you for attending and for all your, those of you who've made comments and questions. And I'm just really sorry we haven't been able to do those justice. Thank you. Bye.